Welcome viewers to our ongoing program, Nuclear Free Future Conversation, coming to you from Burlington, Vermont, from Tom Meeting TV, Channel 17 Center for Media and Democracy. I'm your host, Margaret Harrington. And viewers, this is part two of our program, 75 Years of Nuclear Fallout from Hiroshima to Now. And let's welcome back our guests, Alfred C. Meyer from Physicians for Social Responsibility, and Kevin Camps of Beyond Nuclear. Welcome back, Alfred and Kevin. Hi, Margaret. Thanks, yes. So we're continuing this, this conversation about the uh, nuclear fallout from, 19, from August 6th and August 9th, 1945. So can you uh, just give us a little recap of what we were talking about in part one, and we'll continue on the subject. Well, in part one, we began to tell the story of how, starting with the uh, mining of uranium in the Belgium Congo, great harm was done to the miners, great health problems for the communities and the people in them, uh, and that this led to this huge industrial endeavor, which uh, led to the bombing, the incineration of two Japanese cities, Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Kevin mentioned that initially these explosions, like the very first atomic weapon or atomic explosion, the Trinity test, the Trinity test was used to be listed as the first test and the second and third tests were the two bombs dropped on Japan because the first one in uh, Hiroshima was a uranium bomb, one kind of design, and the second one was a plutonium bomb, which is an entirely different kind of uh, mechanism. So we were field testing these weapons. Uh, we, we talked about that uh, there are strong arguments that say they were not needed to end the war, that um, Japan was trying to surrender. The, the sticking point was whether the emperor could have any rights or respect. And um, then also we wanted to rush the peace process to keep the Russians from taking part in it. Uh, the Russians had a lot of scores to settle with Japan. They very much wanted to be there, but we saw Russia as a real enemy. So using those weapons in one sense was a real message to Russia. And uh, we talked about some of the accidents uh, like the uh, mine tailings breach of the dam in Church Rock, New Mexico, which was a, the biggest release of uh, atomic material in this country. Uh, the, the, this whole endeavor is very costly and very damaging, even if we never use another weapon. Um, and we now, we also mentioned that after going through a period, well, we didn't talk about this, but I'll mention it now, um, that uh, at one point, you know, we had the Cold War, and uh, at one point between Russia and the U.S., there were 72,000 uh, nuclear warheads. And we realized that this is horribly dangerous. There are many uh, treaties signed, international treaties, bilateral treaties, some are multilateral, the Nuclear Nonproliferation Treaty, the Anti-Ballistic Missile Treaty, uh, the Comprehensive Test Man Treaty, uh, all these different means to try to control this genie to kind of at least reduce its size, even if we can't put it back in the bottle. But um, Starting with Reagan, Reagan and Gorbachev and Reykjavik almost got rid of nuclear weapons. And it's to me so tragic because the sticking point was Reagan insisted on his missile defense, the so-called Star Wars program, which Russia, I think rightly saw as an offensive missile uh, you know, uh, weapons system. But because of that, we did not get rid of these things. And so now we're at a point where Trump is pulling us out of treaties and pushing for a huge new nuclear arms race. So not only, and, and to show you how insidious this is, I wanna mention that when President Obama was uh, in office, uh, he worked very hard to get the START uh, two treaty passed, strategic arms, uh, reduction treaty. Reduction treaty. Mm -hmm. New starts. Yeah, the new start. And um, he was successful in that, but there was a price he had to pay. And the price was agreeing 
to a 1.7 trillion, T is in trillion dollar refurbishment of our entire nuclear weapons complex. And to me, if you're refurbishing your entire nuclear weapons complex, I don't think you're getting rid of nuclear weapons, even though a recent U.S. Department of Energy report says exactly that. It says that the only way we can have non-proliferation is if we are dominant in nuclear weapons. And if I can't think of anything much more Orwellian and double speakish than that. So uh, we're, we're at the, on the precipice of this huge dive into uh, new weapons, more weapons, the, there's are not the threats, I mean, you know, the, the, the wrong instruments. Kevin, do you wanna add anything else to kind of summarize where we were? And then the point I would make in handing it over to you is to say that um, if we're gonna build all sorts of new weapons, more usable weapons, oddly enough, um, that it's gonna make a lot more nuclear waste and we haven't a clue as to what to really do with the waste we already have. As Kevin always points out, the very first cupful of nuclear waste created under Stagg Field at the University of Chicago in 1942 still has not been disposed of properly. I'm just reminded of the Hopi prophecy. Um, we've spoken a lot about New Mexico and the Hopi have ancestral lands in New Mexico in fact, the Holtec International dump site targeted at southeastern New Mexico, the Hopi have land claims down there, even though it's far removed from their current reservation in, in Arizona. The Hopi prophecy um, is quite incredible. Um, it came from the creator in the creator's original instructions to the Hopi. And uh, the atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki were a sign to the Hopi to share this warning with the world from their ancient teachings from the creator. In, in their prophecy, the atomic bombs were referred to as a gourd full of ashes because they had no concept of, you know, nuclear weapons per se, but a gourd full of ashes falling from the sky, turning all the land into ashes. And on part one, Alfred spoke about the radioactive ash that fell for days after the Trinity blast in South Central New Mexico. So the Hopi warned, beginning in 1947, they warned the world, they attempted to warn the United Nations General Assembly in their prophecy, it was called the House of Micah because the Hopi didn't even have glass. They knew of this House of Micah, this glass building in New York City and their ambassador, their spiritual ambassador for the spiritual elders, Thomas Banyakia Sr. traveled to the UN time and time again knocking on the door of the House of Micah, trying to speak to the General Assembly, a warning from the Hopi, actually a warning from the Creator, that you human beings are at a crossroads. And if you take this one road, it leads to chaos, catastrophe, and an end. And that is the nuclear road. If you take this other road, um, it's, it's a better outcome. And the Creator would like us to take that other road. So it's just incredible. Um, wisdom and a warning to the world uh, that we had stopped, we'd better stop going down this road. And Alfred mentioned this essentially $2 trillion US nuclear weapons renovation plan. Um, it's madness. Um, I know there's a lot of folks addicted to this nuclear money. New Mexico itself is addicted to this nuclear money. Los Alamos National Laboratory, Sandia National Laboratory are addicted to billions of dollars per year of not cleanup money necessarily. They have a big mess to clean up out there. They are addicted to nuclear weapons manufacture money. So unfortunately, the Trump administration is planning plutonium pit production at Los Alamos National Lab. That's new weapons for new military purposes, a violation of US commitments under the non-proliferation treaty to disarm, to abolish its nuclear weapons. The, the NPT is 50 years old this year. It sure has taken us a while to abolish our nuclear arsenal. We're not the only ones though. Russia is still gung-ho about its nuclear arsenal. They are making um, insane uh, advances, so-called, in you know, nuclear-powered, nuclear-tipped cruise missiles. And they had a, an accident with one in August of 2019 that was a significant nuclear accident, a significant radiological release. People were killed and uh, 
we had better learn, as the Hopi have warned, we had better learn before it's too late. And don't take it from me, take it from Henry Kissinger, of all people, who got together with George Schultz and some Democratic uh, colleagues, former secretaries of state, uh, William Perry, former um, Pentagon chiefs, warning back in 2007 and, and numerous times since, they're called the four horsemen of the nuclear apocalypse. These were nuclear um, war you know, chiefs for the United States. These were um, the top officials in the US government who relied on this so-called deterrent policy to assert US interests around the world for decades on end. They warned that there is one existential threat to the United States. It is nuclear weapons. It is nuclear weapons proliferation. Better abolish, we had better abolish nuclear weapons before they abolish us to uh, echo John Kennedy. Well, the, then talk about the, the treaties, like the non-proliferation treaty that was uh, trashed by President Bush in 2004 with, with handing over uh, nuclear power uh, information to India, which never sound, which never, uh, which never signed the nuclear non-proliferation treaty, and that's a, that's another subject about the the nuclear powers, which include India and Pakistan, and the fact that India itself never never signed the nuclear non-proliferation treaty. Margaret, I'll take a moment to mention a study that uh, PSR did uh, a few years ago, called Nuclear Famine. Um, and it uh, is a book about what would happen if India and Pakistan, for instance, had a limited, small exchange of nuclear weapons. Nothing like the vast stockpiles that the U.S. and Russia have, but this is just a, a little um, nuclear war. This would uh, not only cause great devastation to the people who are bombed and ir irradiated, but it would loft so much dust uh, into the atmosphere from the fires and the explosions that it would reduce um, agricultural output worldwide by 10% for at least a decade. So more than two B as in boy billion people are likely to starve to death should there be a small uh, nuclear conflagration. Mm. And the treaty is even like the NPT. I mean, it's, it's, it's such a fraught topic in my mind because the NPT treaty is about the only one left and at least has people talking in some degree of oversight and exchange of information. Um, but it has the provision which allows for civilian nuclear power. And in part one, we talked about how civilian nuclear power is essential for nuclear weapons. And to illustrate that point, I would look at a, uh, well, you could, you mentioned India. Um, they had a Canadian can-do reactor and, and for peaceful uh, purposes, and that's how they made their first weapons. Um, so it's, uh, you know, saying that the countries have the inalienable right to nuclear power. And, and another example is uh, Iran. Iran's just claiming we, we're just taking our, you know, treaty given right there. But why are we so upset? It's because this is the path to nuclear weapons. It's, it's the same infrastructure. It's the same science, uh, the same technical capacity. Um, there's just slightly different paths right at the end. And Alfred um, mentioned in part one that Eisenhower gave his Atoms for Peace speech in 1953. And another amazing book by um, Arjun Makajani is called The Nuclear yes. Power Deception from 1999. And the thesis um, from my read of that book is that this Adams for Peace speech, this smiley face propaganda, um, was really a cover for nuclear weapons development. Because if you think about it, when he gave the speech in 1953, there were no atomic reactors for electricity in the United States. Yes, the US nuclear Navy under Rickover would build one in Shippingport, Pennsylvania in 1957, the first so-called civilian reactor built by the U.S. Nuclear Navy, a submarine reactor design built on land. Yeah. But reactors didn't start to come online until the early 1960s. Really, they didn't come online in any numbers until the 1970s. Where was all that uranium going? Well, it was going into the 
arms race of the United States. It was a nuclear weapons buildup with a Adams for Peace cover story. And uh, here we go again. I mean, Alfred just mentioned it. If, you know, if thorium reactors pr proliferate internationally, if small modular reactors proliferate internationally, the, the new catchwords of the industry, it's going to give um, nuclear weapons ca capability to these countries. And Saudi Arabia is a really concerning one right now. The Crown Prince on 60 Minutes said right out loud, if Iran develops a nuclear weapon, we'll be right on their heels doing it ourselves. They would use American or Korean nuclear power technology, whether uranium enrichment or plutonium reprocessing, to build a Saudi nuclear arsenal. Talk about a uh, rough neighborhood. I mean, Israel already has nuclear weapons. Um, Iran has said it does not intend to build nuclear weapons, but with the technology could, if it chose to. Saudi Arabia could do the thing, the same thing. Um, Alfred mentioned another um, tough neighborhood in the world, India, Pakistan, and that study that PSR and IPPNW did was about the exchange of 100 Nagasaki-sized bombs causing a nuclear famine that would kill two billion people from starvation. So we're really playing with fire. And as I mentioned, those cold warriors like Kissinger have, have said, we need to abolish these things before they abolish us. Kevin, show me the, what shirt you have on there and what is the significance of that? No. Yeah, I wore it when Diane Rigo and I were on your show. This is my Holtec t-shirt. And it mm -hmm. is the latest environmental injustice, the latest nuclear racism to afflict New Mexico, a majority minority state. New Mexico is a majority of Hispanics and Native Americans, and the white population is the minority in New Mexico. So guess what? The state that's already suffered so much from nuclear since 1943 when Los Alamos moved in, uh, now is being targeted for a high level radioactive waste dump uh, this company called Holtec International, headquartered in New Jersey, wants to dump 100,000 metric tons or even up to 173,000 metric tons of commercial irradiated nuclear fuel in southeastern New Mexico in a Hispanic area that, as I mentioned, uh, has Hopi connections. The Mescalero Apache are very nearby. In fact, the Mescalero Apache, 25 years ago, were targeted for this very dump. Uh, they didn't get away with it that time because they were stopped by traditionals like Rufina Marie Laws and Joe Geronimo, who led the anti-dump effort. This time around, um, groups like this t-shirt, Alliance for Environmental Strategies, a Hispanic uh, environmental justice group, are fighting with everything they have, joined by groups across New Mexico and around the country to try to stop this dump. And um, the fight is very much on. We have a public comment deadline on the draft environmental impact statement of September 22nd. And I should hasten to add that Rose Gardner, the, the co-founder of Alliance for Environmental Strategies, lives in Eunice, New Mexico, which is right on the Texas border. So this whole tech dump is about 35, 40 miles from Rose. The Texas dump, another consolidated interim storage facility proposal for high level waste, is about five miles from Rose at Waste Control Specialists in Texas. It's also called Interim Storage Partners. So that neck of the woods, within 40 miles, two of these high-level radioactive waste dumps that could easily become not temporary or interim, but de facto permanent, are targeted at this area. And we have a national coalition of environmental and environmental justice and anti-nuclear groups fighting with everything we have to try to stop this major radioactive racism that is targeted at that area. And part of the problem with what uh, the waste situation, I would argue, is the lack of congressional respect for science because Yucca Mountain, which uh, was slated to be our geologic repository, was chosen not through the original scientific process outlined in the 1982 Nuclear Waste Policy Act, which called for an assessment of 10 sites and one east of the Mississippi, one west of the Mississippi. In 1987, when Congress amended that act, they just simply up and chose uh, Yucca Mountain as the place. And Yucca Mountain is an area 
uh, that's built out of volcanic uh, tuff. It's a very porous rock. It's in an area of uh, seismic activity. It's in an area of volcanic activity, and it's over an aquifer. I mean, it's ludicrous that this would be chosen as the place to keep something safe for millions of years, but Nevada had little political power back then, and it was, uh, they just were chosen by the wisdom of the congressional votes, not by science. So really, Yucca Mountain, I think, will never open, uh, but it is relevant to what Kevin's talking about, about centralized interim storage, because how do you define interim? You know, there's, if there's no other place to put it, it's, as Kevin mentioned, uh, de facto permanent. So, and, and then we, so uh, people really should uh, follow the, uh, um, the web links to uh, letters and how to make comments and, and just express yourselves because it, it really is, um, you know, the, the few, the many of us against the few of them who are in control. And uh, if we're not active, we'll soon be radioactive. Um, and the other thing to bring up is that <laughs> as if this isn't bad enough, and, and this, uh, my hope is that maybe the, the ludicrousness of this proposal will actually cause action about it. But the Nuclear Regulatory Commission is in the process of, in the back room, rewriting a little regulatory rule which would basically allow vast amounts of radioactive materials being uh, left behind when you shut down a nuclear reactor, a nuclear power plant. And instead of making it go to one of these designated uh, regulated uh, dumps like uh, Yucca Mountain or, or even these consolidated interim sites, that um, this radioactive material could be put virtually any place. It could be put in your town's transfer station just down the road. Now clearly this is a great boon to the industry. The industry was supposed to be saving decommissioning money. So they have huge pots of money that's going to be used for this very expensive complicated thing. But if this very low level waste rule is changed, it changes the entire game. The industry can just dump whatever it wants, wherever it wants. And as mentioned before, radioactivity is uh, tasteless, it's uh, odorless. You need highly sophisticated equipment to measure it. So how do you know what's in your landfill down the road? And uh, this is just, a, you know, it's part of Trump's effort to completely deregulate things and just dump whatever you want, where you want. And this is another issue that we need to be in touch with our uh, state attorney generals, um, our state political parties, our uh, federal legislators, legislators, and tell them, do not do this. We must uh, control this matter as much as we can. We've already greatly sullied our home, the planet Earth. Uh, let's let's not go whole hog on it. Yes, and and just this morning I heard from uh, here in Vermont from uh, Representative Welch and from Senator uh, Sanders, and it was about the the uh, what I signed from the uh, the uh, resource services the uh, Diane Dorigo's organization, Nuclear Sears. Information and Nuclear Resource Services. And near nears net right n i r s net and that was a response from from both of them from congressman welsh and senator sanders but it it uh, was not a definitive condemnation from either one about the uh, the, the the putting of uh, very low level nu nuclear waste into our local landfills i'm sorry to say well i i'd encourage your listeners and viewers to um attend a meeting of the Vermont Nuclear Decommissioning Community Advisory Panel that is scheduled for Monday, September 1st, 21st, Monday, September 21st, beginning at 6 p.m. This is a very important meeting of the NDCAP. It has to do with Vermont Yankees decommissioning. 
And these issues will come up. Very low level waste being allowed to be dumped in local landfills with, with no regulatory control. But also these issues of consolidated interim storage facilities, whether in New Mexico or Texas, the Yucca Mountain dump, all of these issues will likely be discussed because unfortunately, the ENDACAP back in 2015, uh, five years ago, took a position in favor of consolidated interim storage facilities and they've never corrected that position. So as we've discussed, this is uh, an environmental injustice, uh, consolidated interim storage in Texas and New Mexico. And they really need to correct their position because they are speaking on behalf of Vermonters and already the Texas dump is a national low-level radioactive waste dump located above the Oglala Aquifer. Vermont waste is going there. In fact, Vermont and Texas are a compact. They really run the show out there, but they've opened the doors to the entire country. And it, it's already an environmental injustice. It already threatens the Oglala. But this high-level waste would make the situation much worse, as would very low-level waste being dumped in local landfills or incinerated or even recycled or poured down the sewer. And companies like North Star at Vermont Yankee, which is closely connected, in fact, is the same consortium as runs waste control specialists, would very much like to save a lot of money on disposal costs and simply pocket the leftover money as pure profit. That is their business model. So it's gonna take the people of Vermont, it's gonna take the people of the United States stopping these insane proposals that put public health and safety in the environment at risk. We have to get very active. And as Alfred said, contact your elected officials at all levels, federal, state, and local. Okay, gentlemen, are we, are we ready to wrap up part two of our discussion? I, with, I am, uh, I'm f filled with a fear of the future given our past, and uh, I am very grateful, grateful to both of you and the, the organizations that you represent for bringing your message here to Vermont. And, and because we are online, of course, we're all remote at the, at the moment, but we are online, so we have an international audience too. So thank you very much. And, and please, would I'll give you both the floor to, to, uh, to say, uh, you know, to wrap up the show and we'll look forward to part three at, an, at another time. But meanwhile, we'll go through the 75th anniversary of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, 75 years. So thank you, Kevin and Alfred, and I'll give you both the last words. Well, I'd just like to say, thank you. Uh, Margaret, I uh, am empathetic with your sense of foreboding and fear and looking at the horrible parts of our past history, but I take great uh, um, support or, or encouragement from the current huge social justice movement that's afoot in this country. And that's why I've tried to say how much, so much of this atomic uh, effort, the nuclear weapons, nuclear power, is similar to racism and, and is in, in itself racist. And that it's, again, it's a call for the majority of us is this like uh, to, to take action to stop a tiny minority who are endangering all of us terrifically, damaging all of us terrifically, and making a pile of money to boot. That, um, you know, this is a very bountiful world, and uh, we should be able to provide housing and health care and food for all. Uh, you know, there can still be some rich people, they won't be quite as rich, but. Um, you know, that I think it's the time for us to act. And, and I feel personally that um, the only reason we're able to be here to talk today is that the vast majority of people, in fact, are very good, honest, and uh, honorable people. Uh, the nuclear world is filled with stories of near misses of, of people who didn't do what they were supposed to do because they didn't want to blow up the world. And that's why we're here. So it's, it's nip and tuck 
and and you know with all these weapons on high alert it could take just a moment to happen but i also uh, have great hope that we all through the like your efforts of putting this show on the air and getting this message out that the people who are listening to it will take action and we will make these changes thank you margaret thank you thank you kevin well margaret i I noticed the uh, Helen Caldicott book behind you, and uh, I remember hearing her speak once, and she quoted a founder of the Civil Rights Movement who said, when you see a good fight, jump in it. And like Alfred said, we are at a moment of uh, national change for the better uh, with the George Floyd movement. So, um, you know, with Trump proposing a resumption of nuclear weapons testing, on Western Shoshone land in Nevada for the first time since 1992, full-scale nuclear weapons testing. Uh, with all these dump fights, whether it's Yucca on Shoshone land or these dumps in New Mexico and Texas, we have to, um, you know, folks in Vermont have to get clearly through to Peter Welsh that voting in favor of these dumps in New Mexico, Texas, and Nevada is not okay. It's an environmental injustice, and on that reason alone, is not okay. He needs to stop doing that. And Vermonters have a real uh, political power right now with Bernie Sanders advising Joe Biden closely. So on nuclear weapons issues, as Alfred has said, defunding nuclear weapons, like defunding the police and redirecting that funding to human needs and to justice and to reparations. Um, folks in Vermont being in touch with their congressional delegation right now would make a big difference in a lot of ways. So I just encourage people that when you see a good fight, jump in it. So be there for the NDCAP meeting on September 21st. Get those comments in on Holtec by September 22nd. Get those comments in on Texas by November 3rd and change the world. That's what we gotta do, change the world for the better. Thank you.